Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live with the North Somerset Council Executive, or six of us. Um, good evening, too, to those of you who are, well, especially to those who are joining us live, and, and, and hello to those who are catching up with this um, later on or later date. So this is your your chance to quiz the North Somerset Council Executive on it, anything, really, and we'll, we'll do our level best to answer your question, or sometimes we, we have to take an issue away with us. Um, I think this will be or will be our last last Facebook Live before the pre-election period starts. It used to be called Perda, I think, didn't it? Um, I think that starts on the 20th of March. I'm sure lots of you know that we've got uh, elections in North Somerset on the 4th of May, and I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, at some point during the next hour. Uh, so my name is uh, Councillor Steve Bridger. I'm a ward uh, councillor in Yatton and leader of the council. So I'm going to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves and I'll do that in the order that I, I see everybody on my screen anyway. So that's starting with you, Catherine. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Catherine Gibbons. I represent Milton Ward in Western Supermare and I'm the executive member for Children's Services, Lifelong Learning, Skills, and also Ukrainian refugee resettlement falls in my portfolio. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, my name's Ash Cartman. I'm the councillor for Long Ashton, Raxall, Phelan and Lee Woods, and I'm the executive member for finance. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Mark. Good evening, everyone. I'm councillor Mark Hannaford. I'm the councillor for Hillside in Western Supermare, and I'm the executive member responsible for placemaking and economy. Thanks, Mark. Bridget. Good evening, everybody. I'm councillor Bridget Petty. I represent Backwell Ward, and I'm the executive member for the climate emergency, engagement and equalities and diversity. Thank you, Bridget. And uh, last but not least, uh, Steve. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Steve Hogg. I'm the Ward Councillor for uh, Rington and also the Exec Member for Highways and Transport. Thank you, Steve. So I'm um, not sure we've got any uh, questions um, flowing through just yet. I'm sure they're um, percolating. So I think probably a good opportunity to just to say a few words about the, the upcoming election on the 4th of May, because uh, there are some some changes and I'm sure my, my colleagues can help me out on this. So I think the, I guess one of the most important dates is the, is the deadline to actually register to vote. I encourage everyone to register to vote. I think the, the deadline to register to vote is midnight on Monday, the 17th of April. Uh, and obviously a big change this time is uh, you're required to show some photo ID at your polling station. Uh, there's quite a long list of ID that you can you can actually take take with you. We we might want to discuss that. We'll talk about that a little later in the in the stream. Um, if you don't have photo ID or don't think you have any photo ID, you can apply to uh, the council for for a document known as a, a voter authority certificate. Um, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll we'll give you more information about that before the uh, before the hours up. But we've got some questions coming uh through so the first question i've got here is from from nigel thanks for your question nigel uh now that the appeals against airport expansion have finished can we understand the total cost to the north somerset council taxpayer both in terms of councillor time and cash out that has been paid for legal advice um who, who would like to to answer that one um Ash or Steve? I can talk. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know off the top of my head, but the costs were in excess of half a million pounds in terms of the, the original appeal. And they could be a few hundred thousand higher than that. I don't know, but they, they are significant. We know that. Um, I think the decision was made when we lost the appeal wasn't to take it to a judicial review. And part of that was as an outcome of the appeal process, the likelihood that we would be successful in doing that compared to that additional cost. And I think we've seen recently that although many wanted that to succeed, it, it didn't. So, you know, we 
do try and balance the you know, need to represent our community and the values that we were elected to, but also understanding that it is taxpayers' money. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, it's that's my understanding. Um, uh, well, in terms of the, uh, the 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 cost, Bridget, you want to come in? Oh, um, just a comment on the question. So it, it referred to kind of costs associated with councillor time. Um, so just to be clear, councillors aren't in a, a paid salary, but we do um, get allowances. Um, and then it is for each councillor for their wards to spend time based on issues that matter to their communities. Um, and for uh, as, as a Backwell councillor, um, I live adjacent to the Backwell is adjacent to the airport and the residents are heavily impacted by uh, the airport as it is and the potential for expansion. So residents were asking me to be, you know, what I was doing was speaking up for the concerns of residents um, and, and just to make clear that that, you know, that is part of the role of, of a councillor, depending on what their residents are asking for, for them to put their energies and time into the things that matter to them. So I just kind of wanted to share that's my reflection on how my time as a councillor was spent um, opposing the expansion because it mattered to local residents how they were being impacted by by that airport and the proposal to extend. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. Nigel, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, I think we'll move on to uh, Sue. It's a very, very broad general question. Why are there so many roadworks in Clevedon and I guess the surrounding area? Well, there's lots of Lots of uh, development, lots of infrastructure that needs to be put in for that development. Steve, I'm not sure if you want to say anything about that. Uh, yeah, sure, Steve. So I think there are there are a lot of roadworks at the moment, and I think they probably need to be as well. So obviously we've got the the public realm improvements that have been happening for some time up on on Hill Road and, and the beach. We've also had quite a bit of utilities work done, and of course that's outside that local authority control. I know that there's been some utilities work at, at Six Ways. But we have also been resurfacing roads in Cleveland. So recently you will have seen roadworks in on Linden Road and some of the associated roads around there. But we do also have a big cyclical maintenance programme where we're going round and, and patching up uh, potholes. We've had a particularly difficult winter this year because we've had that perfect storm, uh, the combination of uh, um, excessive rain uh, followed by uh, freezing conditions, which has broken up the surface on, on many roads. So um, we are doing our best to get out to those those areas that need uh, remedial work within 28 days. I think we're probably a bit behind that at the moment, just by sheer you know fact of the, the volume of work that we have to do. But I think that's probably some of it. There are also a lot of um, telecoms companies out there kind of doing their own thing. And again, that's outside of local authority control. So it's a bit difficult to understand exactly what Sue's referring to. But Sue, if you want to drop me an email with any specific areas that you're concerned about, then please do. Um, so my my email address will be on the, the council website and, and, and uh, should be easily found. Thanks, Steve. I, I mean, as you say, in terms of, because we're often asked this, aren't we? But as you were saying, in terms of the, the council has you know, pretty limited control over what utility companies um, who wish to install and maintain their sort of their, their kit on the public highway they have a legal right of access they really have quite a lot of a lot of rights i mean aware that we do our some of our council officers do hold quarterly meetings i think with the utility companies and they try and coordinate as much as they can to ensure that there's you know um that there's sort of collaboration where that where that's feasible but i mean that that is a challenge uh we continually sort of ask those utility companies to communicate in a sort of timely and effective matter with residents when work's about to be done uh you know in your in your street for example when that doesn't happen you know it, it is the fault of the utility companies it's not the fault of north somerset council we do our very best to ensure that there is coordination uh, as much as possible uh, but thanks for the question sue i've got a question here from from steve uh, who says hello i'm in banwell and wonder where we are with any decisions I'm in favour, by the way. So I'm assuming, Steve, you're talking about the Banwell bypass. Um, so the latest situation with the Banwell bypass is uh, that uh, we're at a stage where uh, there's a planning application that was submit submitted, obviously, um, last year. That will uh, come before the local planning authority, which is North Somerset Council. 
and, and councillors are at a committee meeting on the 15th of March. I think that will take place and they will determine the planning application, whether or not to grant permission uh, for the bypass uh, to be built. At the same time, of course, there's a lot of work that has been been going on behind behind the scenes. So should should the permission be granted? Uh, the next thing that would happen is that sometime in the summer, the new council, the new council that's elected on the 4th of May, will basically, um, a paper will go to the full council meeting in order to uh, award uh, potentially the, the the construction contract for the for the for the bypass. So, but really, we're at a point now where it, it's all to do with the determination of, of of the planning application, and it's little more we can really say at the moment because of that uh, because of the that particular stage we're at with the um, with the planning. But, but just to add, the planning committee is an open meeting, isn't it? So members of the public can come along to that that planning committee and hear what's being discussed. It is, it is. And the, pap the papers for that will be published about a week in advance of, of, of the meeting. And yeah, the public are, are very welcome. That will be in the, the new council chamber and the town hall in in Western Supermare. Uh, I've got a question here from, from Martin Summerall, uh, addressed to, to me. I You attended the Cleveland Town Council meeting last week. Why did you arrive after the meeting had started? Uh, that's That's not true at all, actually. <laughs> I arrived before the meeting started. Uh, this shows poor form and contempt for the town and its council. So, Martin, uh, obviously, we know each other a little bit, don't we, from 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 Facebook. Uh, I attended the Beaton Town Council meeting um, last week, as you said. I was there for two hours from the start, and I stayed until um, the end. Um, if you've got a specific question, if you've got a specific question about Cleveland, we can we can address that. But I'll, I'll, I'll move on. I would say I would say Steve, you showed them great respect by turning up before the meeting started, and not after. Yeah, yeah. So well done. So, uh, potholes. A question here from 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 Simon. Getting silly out there now. I know budgets have been cut, but on main routes to Western Hospital, Broadway, especially, why aren't these being classified as urgent? Um, can I just, Steve, can I just pop in before I hand it over to Steve Hogg, of yeah. course? I mean, I know exactly where Simon's talking about. It's on the junction. Um, I believe it has been reported, but I will chase it up later and check with Steve. Um, it's just where all the cars turn into and out of uh, the Carnation Estate, Loxton Road. Uh, it's obviously torn the surface uh, and it needs repairing. Biggest problem, of course, is they've got to find a time to do it when it's quiet. And that road is very, very busy uh, because they'll have to shut the area off so people can work uh, because it wouldn't be safe to work in the middle of the highway with cars flying both ways. So and, and, and it's a major trunk road to the seafront from uh, and obviously to the hospital. So tricky one. Simon's quite right, though. It does need work and it does need desperate work. And I, I'll pick that up with Steve because I can tell him exactly where it is. But Steve might just want to add around the problems around the budget, of course, because he does that so eloquently. Thank you, Mark. Steve. Thanks, Mark. Talk? Yeah, yeah, sure. And thanks for the thanks for the question, Simon. And I, you know, believe me, I, I feel your pain. I, I do understand it. It is very, very difficult out there. You might have caught the end of the last question where I was saying that we've had that perfect storm of freezing conditions and very, very wet weather, which has made it, you know as bad as I can remember it out there, and it certainly is very bad at the moment. Um, the teams work on a, on a, on a basis of a 28-day turnaround, so they should get out to, to be able to provide some sort of repair to a pothole within 28 days of it being reported, but there are two problems really with that. One is quite a lot of potholes are out there simply aren't reported, so there are quite a high number of potholes that people are passing in their car every day thinking why why aren't they repairing that and the reality is it's not on the council's radar so i would urge anybody that is seeing potholes that aren't being fixed on a regular basis to uh, fill out the form which is available through our website it's a fairly straightforward form to fill out ex the exact location of the of the pothole to make sure it's in our system and then once it's in the system, we should be getting to them within 28 days. And I know that we have slipped back from that purely because of the volume of potholes that we're currently having to deal with and the extent of the budget that we have available to us. So we have, you know, a diminished, a greatly diminished budget and, and limited resources to be able to get out there. But we should get out there to fix it. Now, on those areas that you talk about around 
hospitals, it's obvious that that would be a priority. And I'm certainly happy to catch up with Mark uh, separately after this call and, and so that I can understand exactly where it is and we'll see if we can get that prioritised for you. So I suppose two messages really. One is please bear with us. We are working to get back to 28 day turnaround. And secondly, make sure you are reporting potholes wherever possible or some, somebody is reporting them on your behalf. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Simon. Question here from uh, Steve, Dan. Steve, Steve, yeah. sorry, Steve. Can Ash and I come in? We just wanted to say something. Sorry, I didn't see you put your, your hands up. Apologies. Yeah, uh, first you first, Ash. Um, I was just going to say. I just wanted to. Bridget. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say that um, over the past couple of years, uh, I have been reporting potholes, um, but also we've worked with the team to make sure make that process reporting easier. And um, and I do think that when you go on to report, for one thing, I know that it's annoying to be logged in, but it does help and it does make it quicker for me on my phone. Um, and now it explains about how like you define it by how deep it is and and how wide it is, and that can be quite helpful for prioritization. And and I'm not talking about that. Broadway one that's in, tricky in the middle of the road but in your local streets that can be really um I found the whole process had, had improved uh, over the past couple of years but also once um they get assessed you see that they spray either a box around based on different colors and sometimes that can just give you the nod that someone has been out to assess that pothole down your road um and I just I kind of I consider that a bit of a, a flag for knowing if your situation is being progressed, um, but do certainly take the time to, to report them. And I think the process of reporting has got better. So if you were annoyed before, it might be better now. Thanks, Bridget. Ash, you wanted to say something too. Oh, I was only going to pick up on Simon says about the budget. We, we are actually putting more money in, but the trouble is that the holes are starting to appear faster than we can put money in. Um, we're putting more in government's frozen their bit it's funded a combination of the two so i think we're all quite aware that that we need to perhaps think of something a bit more transformative in the way we approach this which i know there's some work going on okay thanks ash okay i'll move on to the next question which um catherine you wanted to say something as well I was just going to say very quickly, following on from what Bridget said, uh, the other way to report it, of course, is to contact your local councillor, because I get a lot of that in my inbox. And uh, I don't think we have any additional influence over Ash or, or Steve Hogg, but at least, you know, we can pursue it for you if you find the reporting on the website difficult. And can I just, I'm really sorry to keep going on, but it's potholes, it's a, it's, a, it's a big concern for people. The other thing, what I don't want people to, to, to be too worried about is if they find they've got a few potholes in a particular location, you know, one or two reports for that general area is absolutely fine. The, you know, the guys will fix what they can while they're there. So you, you don't have to go and literally report every single pothole in a, in a small area. As long as we've got, you know, a couple of them on the radar, then they will they will fix others when they see them. And people will know when we when we're on our radar because there'll be a little painted circle around the round the pothole, and that means we it sort of yeah it should be pretty imminent Hopefully, for, that, yeah. for that to be uh, to be patched patched up. Yeah. Okay, I will move on now to another question, which is from Dan. So Dan says two weeks without recycling being taken and green bins missed also, and you want more money? Wouldn't mind if you already did what you were paid for. Ridiculous. So obviously Dan's. Uh, pretty miffed understandably so so i think one of the i should say one of the things i'm most proud of actually that we've done in the last few years is is effectively taking our waste and recycling contract back in back in house like we set up an, an arm's length uh company um previous to that the service was 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 patchy at, at best i think it improved a lot um last year 2022 certainly in in my ward since april it's been really really good actually it's best best as, as good as it's ever ever been but that's not to say of course there'll be individual uh, instances where people have get get mis miscollections and if that's if, particularly if that's an assisted collection that's obviously um you know really serious and we need to need to know about it so i think probably the easiest thing dan is is for, for you to let us know you know where you where you are um or for us to you know uh contact you in some some way or for you to contact your local ward, ward councillor and uh the team are really pretty good in in um 
you know getting a collection out to you the next available uh slot so apologies for that uh Dan. i think there's an email address waste man it's the waste man isn't it it's the waste man at n-somerset.gov.uk so if you were to email um your specific um you know your your, your address dan and the spe specific issues you've had um then you know that'll be the easiest way to do it or you can uh, contact your local ward councillor anybody want to say yeah i was just going that? to say that yeah that we we had a couple of areas in my ward which were being mysteriously missed and once it was on the, the radar i have to say that the teams were very good at resolving it and um it's all working smoothly now it just sometimes needs somebody to get in touch and highlight the fact that there is a problem okay thanks catherine okay uh we'll move on uh so anne has a question here please could you advise when the winterstoke road bridge will be repaired with the current weight limit all heavy traffic is using devonshire road which is causing significant noise shaking house is and danger to children at broad oak uh steve can I come to you on this one or or ash i I feel like I looked it up because I saw in advance it was coming. And and sorry, that's Steve. If you want to pick up, that's fine. No, that's okay. that's fine. The 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 late the information I had at the beginning of February said end of August for completion. Um, a slight delay is there sorting out some technical specifications with between the council and the MOD because the MOD I believe own the existing bridge until it's the works complete. In which case, then it will form part of the local highway network. Yeah, well, that, that sums it up brilliantly. And they did present a paper a couple of councils ago. So what, what I was, is the, is the question, is it Anne? Is it Anne who asked the question? I didn't quite yes. get the name of the person who asked the question. Yeah, so Anne. Anne, if you want to send an email to me directly, I can give you a bit more detail on on, on exactly why it's been delayed and, and some of the, the, the sort of dates around the, the schedule for completion and that sort of thing. But Ash has outlined it uh, perfectly well there. So Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, thanks both. Uh, move on to the next question. There are one or two questions here about the elections and voting, and I'll, I'll probably come back to those. Uh, David has a question. What is happening with Middle Engine Pit in Nelsey? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Does anyone on the call, <laughs> anyone in the team uh, know anything about that? David, that might be something we have to, to get back to you on, uh, if that's to do with the planning application, perhaps. Bridget, any ideas on that one? As the closest ward member, but obviously not a ward member for. for no, me. sorry. Yeah, no. Okay, so apologies, David. None David, of us can help you with that. If Mark? David would like to email me, if we can pop that email address up, because if it's a planning issue or if it's a placemaking issue, I can pick it up and have a chat with David to to, to resolve what what he's concerned or what he proposes. Uh, more than happy to do that if he would like to email me a contact and we can and I can make contact with him. Thank you, Mark. OK, move on to the next question, which is from uh, from Rob. Uh, question to Steve. I, that's prob probably me, but I might come to you first on this um, other Steve and then I'll make some make some comment. What are your thoughts about the passion demonstrated by a range of Clevedon residents against the public realm changes in Clevedon, the beach in particular? Um, perhaps the opportunity to Steve just to talk in broad terms about what, what we're doing down on the, the seafront and Hill Road. Do you want to kick off on that one? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think, well, I'll, I'll answer the question first. So, I mean, I, I, clearly, Rob, um, you know, there is, it, it's a controversial scheme and there has been a, a, a well-organised campaign of people who are, you know, are against, against the scheme. Um, I understand that, and obviously, you know, people do feel the the, the, the emotions are quite high about it. However, um, this is part, so. What I want us to focus on is the completion of the scheme, and it, you know, I am very much looking forward to it being part of the start of, rather than it being just seen as as a sort of isolated scheme in and of itself. What I want us to start thinking about is this is the the flagship beginning of our peer to peer way. So. Our, you know, it's going to be our peer-to-peer -peer way, which is going to connect Clevedon uh, and Western for the first time, I think, in 40 or 50 years since people have been talking about it. A 13-mile link between the two towns that will enable people to cycle, to walk, to ride horses, 
to any means they wish to be able to connect those two towns together. And this is really the sort of centerpiece of that, really. So I know and I do recognize that change is difficult. And, you know, there's been a lot of changes that have come quite quickly um, in Clevedon, and it's, it's a lot to get used to. Uh, however, I do feel that we need to deliver the scheme and allow some time for it to bed in and for people to become familiar with it. Uh, and I'm confident and optimistic that that uh, it will it will be be seen as as an asset uh, in due course. But you know, I do recognise there is some there is some um, some difference of opinion locally, uh, and I and I recognise that. I think that you know the broad ambition remains the same, and you know we are focused on delivering that as part of that strategic peer to peer way. But it doesn't mean that we won't listen to residents in terms of making changes that need to be changed. So. The circle that appeared uh, a few weeks ago was quite unconventional and probably was a step too far, very difficult for people to get their heads around what that was. And so obviously that's been changed and is now a more conventional mini roundabout. But, you know, in essence, when I visit Cleveland, which I do quite a bit, you know, we have we have altered it. So we've removed, we've, we've changed it from a 30 mile an hour to a 20 mile an hour uh, limit. Uh, we've got fewer cars parked on the seafront, but you know the parking still remains in other, in other locations. Um, the Hill Road scheme, which is finished, you know, I've been to visit that, and I think that looks fantastic. And it was really busy when I went up there, and I think it looks great. Um, and I I just wish we could we could just give it some time, allow the teams to finish the work that they've started, allow it some time to bed in, and 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 for us all to um, to get used to the new the new road layout. But you know, I, I do acknowledge uh, your, you know, your your question, um, and realise that, that you know, it's, there are some differences of opinion out there. Thanks, Steve. And, and if I can add to that, I mean, it. Of course, the the irony is we initially intended to deliver that scheme and, and finish it before before last summer, but we actually did listen to to local trade traders and local wall members actually who requested that we actually wait. Um, until the end of uh, until summer passed and we, we started the work obviously in late autumn time late autumn and of course that that meant that we've we've um we've gone into the the, the colder winter months so being uh, still haven't been able to apply that textured surface um to create the, the pedestrian crossing points and to some of the more interesting uh, elements of, of of the scheme to make them make make more obvious sense perhaps uh so it has rather dragged dragged on a bit and you know apologies to everyone in cleveland for the disruption and inc inconvenience you know just to follow on from from the previous question i did attend a a, a, a meeting at cleveland town council last week and i think there are probably 40 or 50 people who were um who were there who, who all appear to be a, a, opposed to to the scheme and i i think i would separate out a lot of general comment of, of of opposition to the scheme and people who want it to, to be to revert back to what it was before uh we're not going to do that but there were some people who spoke who seemed to have some very genuine uh granular issues that absolutely we will uh listen to as we have listened to all the way through the uh gestation of this scheme and through it through it throughout its sort of uh delivery and we've made made some tweaks, made some changes uh, already, as, as, as Steve has said. When it when it's finished, there'll be yet another safety audit that will be done by an external uh, local authority. And uh, and there may, well, may well be some things that we need to sort of tweak and, and change, but uh, we won't be going back to to what, um, what it was like like before. But um, so I'd, I'd separate the two things from those who have been opposed generally to the scheme uh to to the very specific uh issues that some people certainly have had which we we have listened to and we will continue to to, to listen to and there's there's constant engagement um it, it, it's not as if we we, we haven't engaged uh, locally it, it, it would be wrong to suggest that there hasn't been that that uh, constant uh, consultation and engagement okay Anybody else want to say anything on that? Otherwise, we'll we'll move on. Uh, Heidi has a question. Do you know the outcome of yesterday's planning and regulation meeting regarding Devil's Bridge leading to Bleeden Hill? 
Um, I'm not sure any of us do any of us sit on the, the planning and regulatory committee. Uh, Mark, I'm not it'll sure. Be on, it'll be on the website, won't it? But... Um, I believe because I, I was speaking to councillors who were involved in that, that um, the decision was passed. To approve. To approve, yes. Yeah. Which I think was about adding safety measures to... It was um, about safety measures to a bridge that... Um, well, has I'm a suicide going. risk associated yes. with it. Yeah, I wasn't going to go into too much detail, but yes, that was the crux of it, yeah. And I, and I understand there were maybe some design comment or, or other opposition, but I think that from what I understood, again, from speaking to colleagues who were on the committee yesterday, yeah. um, I think it's ne Network Rail or because the yes. bridge has in, is important and it is um, is embodied Kingdom Brunel design, but yeah. the railings had um, taken the design route that similar to like what's been used at the suspension bridge. So it's sympathetic to the landscape. Um, but Indeed. sadly, in this day and age, we do need these um, safety requirements and and we, you know nobody wants to know of anybody loved one or otherwise having been involved in any accidents and situations so yeah it feels appropriate that's what I was going to say because I, I in my ward in Milton we have had issues um, sadly with the death on the railway lines and there the demand is for a bridge over it with the pr appropriate barriers rather than just a crossing so such things are a very sensitive issue and it's about balance as you say Bridget of keeping the respect for uh, a bridge that is uh, a landmark and a specific design feature as well as making sure that we are keeping people people safe I know that speaking to members of uh, various groups like Samaritans just a small impediment to somebody at a moment, a crucial moment, can make all the difference. So that's why it was so important to people who are concerned about the risks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Catherine. OK, I'll move on to a question from Helen. What's happening with the building on the seafront where the Victorian cafe was? Needs to be done ASAP. Doesn't look good at all at the moment. This includes the loos to be reopened as well. Um, I guess Helen is talking about Western Supermare. Mark, do you want to respond yep. to Helen? I can pick up that. Thank you, Helen, for the question. Um, yes, the, the current um, tenants uh, lease had expired. They chose not to renew. I don't. You know, they did a fantastic job. Their dad did a fantastic job, and sadly, they lost their dad last year uh, or the year before. And they and they kept it going until the end of the lease. But they both decided different challenges in life. Um, so it is a, a listed building, a grade listed building. So we are having a survey done on it. We're looking at the works that need to be done on it to get it all back together. And we will be deciding uh, around uh, the whether a tenant wants to do that or whether we do it and then we let it like that. So we are pushing to get this open again as soon as possible. It is a great building um, and it was a great facility, but uh, I can assure you we are trying to get this open for for this season, early, uh, you know, late spring, uh, but it does need a great deal of work done to it on an exchange to a new owner because, you know, the if you want food, you you have to exit the building to go to the toilets, and we would like to see opportunities possibly around being able to have toilets in the building as well, or being able to uh, get to the toilets through the building. So, yes, we're on it. Yes, we want to fix it. Yes, we 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 are aware the the, the significant importance of that building on the seafront, and and Helen, we will we will strive to get it open ASAP. Thank you, Mark, appreciate it. Uh, I can see David's come back and, and I think, David, you're probably talking about the middle engine pit in, in Nelsey. Went to consultation, plan produced, no change since 2021. So obviously David's very, very specific. I suggest that you get in touch with your, your local ward councillor in, in Nelsey to, and, and take that up with them and they can follow up with our, our planning team. Yes. This may have been also part of the two towns work and the placemaking work, because I do. Um, so I, I think that that could have been part of was the placemaking work, um, which was around kind of thinking about Nailsy's future and, and consultation with with what kind of thing Nailsy community wants to see in its area going forward. But I had sorry, I don't have more detail, but I think that's good to get in touch with your ward councillor. Thanks, Bridget. OK, I can see some more. More questions generally about uh, the Cleveland Seafront. Um, I think we've 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 given our point of view on the seafront. Uh, I will pick up on on Amy's point here, um, addressed to you, Steve, which I think we we can answer. So, how much of the pier to pier way is going to be on cycle lanes, and how much on the public highway? 
Do you want to? I don't know the exact, I'm not sure of the exact distance, but it's either going to be, it's a mixture of, of quiet lanes and, and specific um, specific cycleway or not necessarily cycleway. It could be used for, you know, anybody on a, on a walking or equestrian use as well. I'm not sure of the exact split between uh, between road. I'd have to check it out and come back to Amy. So I'm really happy to do that, take that away and, and find out. But the 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 um, the peer to peer way, it's 13, just over 13 miles, and it will either be on um, dedicated uh, cycleway or on a quiet lane. Um, so, and I'll you know I'm quite happy to go back and find come back to Amy and find out what the exact uh, distances are. Unless anybody else knows. Well, like you, I, I don't know the, the, the exact no. split, but obviously, as, as Amy's suggesting, and she's right, that there is a split between um, new new cycle path uh, that we've yes. created and, and obviously existing rural rural routes. Yeah. Um, we're also like trying to, line, yeah. yeah, we're so also trying to, to link up with the with the with the strawberry line as well uh, in, in Yatton around Kingston, Kingston Bridge, this little project that um, we hope to deliver by the end of the next financial year to, to, to be able to link up the strawberry line with with that new peer to peer way when it opens in the um, end of May or uh, early June time, hopefully. Uh, okay, uh, Kimmy, thank you for the X5 route uh, back, a grateful, from a grateful nurse. Yeah, we were able to, to save the, um, the X5 route in October. And Steve, that route's gonna be in, enhanced, isn't it, from, from, from April? Yeah, so there were a number of enhancements to to commercial routes, obviously, as part of our of our BSIP program. So we've got a significant amount of investment in in public transport, the second highest in the country. And so, you know, anybody watching this now, you are going to see and feel a, a real step change, I think, in public transport over the next few months. The X5 is just one example. Uh, there are several of the commercial services provided by First Bus that are going to be. Um, more frequent, uh, with greater capacity, thanks in part to the the road prioritisation uh, work that's just about to start, uh, starting obviously on the Long Ashton Bypass, um, but also supplemented with other demand-based services so that, you know, not everybody is near uh, one of the X services run by First Bus. So if you find yourself in a more rural area of North Somerset, then it's quite possible and, and probably likely that you'll be able to take advantage of the new demand responsive services to connect to those uh, commercial buses. So we've had a lot of pain, we've felt a lot of pain, and I know everybody watching this and anybody that is a, uh, a user of public transport here will have felt the pain of the um, hollowing out of the public transport network over, over recent uh, months. And of course, we've talked a lot about um, the shortage of drivers and the impact of COVID. Um, but you know, I really do feel confident and, and optimistic that as the weeks and the months go by, that you will really start to see and feel a, a step change. And we're really looking forward to getting out into the community over the next few weeks to talk to you about how this is all going to work, particularly the demand responsive service that's going to be working out in the in the villages, because that's the bit that I'm probably more excited about, because that's the real um, the real sort of transformational part. I think that's going to connect a lot of our 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 communities who have who've been without a bus. I mean, my own ward, for example, Rington, has got one two-hourly service, but it's largely without a bus service for all of the four years that I've been a councillor. And I've made promises to people that whilst I was a councillor, I'd bring back a bus, and it's been extremely difficult. I know other parts of the region are struggling with, with lost services at the moment. I think we've reached the, the, the bottom of the, the barrel, if you like, for want of the word, in terms of the pain that we have felt on, on lost services. And I think it's going to be um an improved outlook for us uh, from here on in so you know i'm very much looking forward to sharing all of this news with the community over the next few weeks but yeah i'm pleased about the x5 obviously because that's uh, that's going to make a big difference for people uh thanks very much steve and uh one of the enhancements to the x5 will be when we finish the uh, the, the the improvements to the high street in Yatton, we hope to reroute the X5 through through the village, which leads me on to a question here from Julie, who's asking about those road safety and alterations in Yatton. Are they still on track to be finished this year? Um, and don't worry, Julie, we haven't we haven't covered that. You haven't missed missed anything. Uh, yes, they are, Julie. Yeah, they were due to start uh, Monday, 
this week um there was a little issue in that the, where they were due to start i didn't feel that there had been adequate consultation with the residents um uh, so i stopped the work on monday so we're doing a little bit of rephasing of the of the projects it's a very complicated project as you all know yet and high street is a very complex uh complex uh road lots going on absolutely perfect if you're in the take want to take a real life hazard perception test there's always just so much going on so it's a very complicated project to deliver uh it's a five month project there's about 100 construction days uh required to deliver uh all the different elements to that scheme so the, the first part of the of the project we delivered last autumn which was creating that new uh entrance from the uh from the side of the the co-op store in this in the in, in yatton precinct into yatton schools uh which which i think is fantastic and it's been you know very well received by by residents and it's it basically stops um children and their their, their, their parents and guardians having to walk along the very narrow uh stretch of yatton high street uh, they can they can go in now through a much safer safer route into into their school. We've got um, some pedestrian uh, some new crossings going in, and the existing zebras are being uh, will be slightly raised. We've got some uh, lots of pay, uh, sort of footways pavements that will be widened, uh, and pretty much the whole length of Yatton High Street will become a, a twenty mile twenty mile an hour uh, zone. So the work will start imminently and will run probably through to about July time, Julie. So, but there's lots of, it's a very complicated scheme to, to sort of uh, deliver in terms of getting the traffic management right. Because obviously you can't close Yatton High Street for, uh, for for five months. It's going to all happen in, in, in short sort of phases. And certainly when it, we won't move on to, you know, the next phase until we've finished, um, finished a particular phase. So um uh, steve can i just add uh, sorry yes. I, I don't know you'd finished but i was just saying uh, you know how excited i'm about that scheme because i think it you know it's really coherent scheme for yatton so all too often councils are criticized for sort of piecemeal 20 mile an hour zones that don't really work and they don't extend far enough or they go too far but it really makes sense you know if you if you see the eyes that see the world through the eyes of a seven-year-old child on its way to school um you know the changes the raised crossings the 20 mile an hour um the continuity through through yatton i think that's going to make such a big difference for parents walking their, their children to school and for people shopping um because you know uh, you know we had to do something because at the moment obviously it's it's very difficult through there so you know i think you deserve a lot of credit there steve for, for seeing that project through and i know we've got a little bit of a hiccup at the start of it but i think once it's finally delivered i think it's going to be a real uh, something to be proud of and, and um, a really fantastic scheme Thanks, Stevie. Yeah, I've had, you know, some people say to me, well, look, you know, um, is there a road safety issue in Yatton? And actually, there have been a couple of um, deaths in, in Yatton over the last, uh, you know, um, couple of couple of decades. But it's not just about those sort of those tragic extremes. It's, it's about the perception of safety as well. If people yeah. feel it's not safe uh, to walk to school uh, in, in a in any street, uh, they're, they're going to hop into their car, aren't they? And if mm. only, my view is, if 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 only ten or fifteen percent of people who who use the car for the school run were to to to, to walk or cycle or scoot, that would actually make a huge difference to those people who have to be in their cars um, and with and with ease congestion. But you know, it's it's there's lots of moving parts uh, to 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 those sorts of schemes. And of course, once the once the once the demand responsive travel and the X five come back and people have got alternatives to to using the car, then you know I think it will only only add to the benefits there for Yatton. Thanks, uh, Julie. Again, asking when will the uh, park on the new housing estate next to the bridge in Yatton be open for use? It's been left since uh, I assume June twenty twenty two. Julie, that's obviously there. There are two two um, play areas on that large development. One has been open for, for quite quite a long time with a multi-use games area. Um, but yeah, there is that small play area which has been sort of, you know, fenced off with Harris fencing for, for, for months and months. 
Uh, I've chased Bloor Holmes about that. I haven't got an up update for you, but um, yeah, like you, I'm uh, a bit perplexed to why that isn't yet open to for, for, for use. But it's something that I'm uh, that I've been chasing. Uh, go to a question here from Nick. Are there any plans for traffic calming through Ewart Road in Milton, as it's a rat run and people fly around the Milton Road end? Can I take that, please? Uh, Yes, Catherine, over to you. Yes, hello, Nick. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, it's something that really concerns us. And in fact, I'm not going to put my colleague Steve Hogg on the spot, but I did speak to him the other day, and we have agreed that you and officers will have a good walk round Will Milton and look at that area. And basically, I think we want advice as to what kind of traffic calming measures could be put in place. There have indeed been near misses there. I'm... Uh, only the other day a resident contacted me and child was nearly hit so yeah it's very much on our radar as world councillors and steve we're looking forward to that um tour of milton and its well problems you, i am really supportive when i'm often contacted by ward members who want me to go and have a little look around uh, an issue that i've got and i'm super supportive of all of that the only thing that i, I have a particular preference for is that we that we try to agree what the problem statement is before we start to try and identify what the solutions are because quite often I I turn up and everybody's already worked out what the solution is and then if you actually track it back you think actually you're fixing the wrong problem but I'm really yeah. supportive I'm very very happy to come out with officers yeah. and I think what we can do is look at what the options are yes. and then if there's a scheme that we think could be brought forward we can get it into our front door process for properly scoping and and, and working out and, and putting it into the program for future delivery. In, indeed, that's exactly what we want. And, in, and to be in fairness, the group of the residents who approached me said exactly that. We don't want to come to you and say, we want this, we want that. We don't know what the best option is. And we There is something needed. And we need yeah. you to advise us as to what you can do to make this road safer for our children and for everybody, of course. So thank you, Nick, for raising that because it's good to get it out there in the open. We are on it. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Steve, I was just going to say that um, I think that this week they uh, we had um, a set of consultations close and it included safer routes to school, it included conversations about 20 miles an hour, it, can, it included conversations about um, uh, livable neighbours asking the community what they thought. It was, it was quite a lot going on, but at the same time it really was the council going out and asking um, whether we felt the community felt that this was something they did support whether it would be positive for their community, whether it would be negative for their community, whether this isn't what they want on their street or they think it would be a problem nearby. Or So uh, that consultation closed at the beginning of the week. Um, I know officers actually had um, an, a deadline come from DFT, the Department for Transport, um, that was due in today. So they had to do some rapid work on that. Um, but, but of course, the bidding for these projects, like more cycleways or livable neighbourhoods or things like that, our, our department and team have to bid for that kind of money but are committed to trying to make to listen to what the community needs and what they're saying they need in their local streets so that they can enjoy living in the way that they want to be living and recognizing that maybe not everybody wants to use their private car anymore and, and how could we have a an area that's safer for for all of us yeah i think bridget raises some interesting points there. And, I, and i think obviously the, the results of that uh, consultation i think we'll be reviewing as an exec next week as well and i think the response rate is really high actually i think there's been many, many hundreds of people that have responded to that consultation. So that's really good. And I think, you know, what we want to do as a council is try to apply a bit more strategic thinking around these things and thinking a bit more about what do we want our streets and our roads to feel like, you know, what's the lived experience rather than just piecemeal altering, you know, arbitrarily altering a speed limit or, or you know, putting in a, a small scheme somewhere and, and sort of trying to address things in a more a transactional way we want to look a little bit step take a step back and look a bit more holistically around around the county and see what we can do strategically to make it a, a you know a, a safer place for for people who may not choose to drive their car but, but uh, take other means of transport and steve can i just add that in that consultation there was a great deal of discussion around milton road where i think you'll find a question later where there was a uh, you know there's been accidents and and clearly very worrying for parents and so there has been a great deal of work about how we make Milton Road safer within that consultation. And therefore, Steve and the team will be 
trying to drive forward those as those those safety measures as part of that consultation so that covers the question off rather than coming back but of course that's in the same area as you at road so there's clearly a traffic issue there thank you mark and thank you all and uh, nick thanks thanks for the question there's another nick it's about buses again, uh, for example, the X5, is it running after April or not? Those mini bus services, long story short, when can we expect a bus service announcement? Steve, you spoke about this this earlier, the X5, yes, we're keeping it, yes, we're enhancing it. I think there'll be a Saturday service when they're from, yeah. from April, the X5. You've talked about the demand responsive services. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. First made their announcement this morning. I think Helen, Helen has uh, answered that for us. And if you go to the First West of England website, they list the... the the service enhancements, uh, which I think start on Sunday, the uh, 2nd of April, and I think our demand responsive uh, services start the following the following day, don't they? That's right. Yeah, I think that's obviously been answered that question by the sounds of it by Helen. So that, that's that's good. But I think, as I say, any any of the all of the the the, the X services run by first will be will be improved in some way. So even the X one, which is quite successful now that runs between Western and Bristol, I think there'll be increased frequency and increased capacity, um, largely aided as well, of course, by the bus prioritization, which is going to see traffic light signal prioritization for buses and those sorts of things. Uh, to enable the buses to get to their destinations probably 10 to 15 percent quicker than they currently do because they get stuck in the traffic um so yeah so, so it's exciting times ahead so there was like a there was a meeting about buses about a, a year ago and i'd and i'd taken the bus from backwell on the x1 to western and then it was got stuck and it got delayed and it was yeah. you know just another embarrassing moment when you do try to use the buses and they don't get there on time so i think that for residents it does matter you know that they can make their appointments they don't have to allow so much extra time what if this one doesn't come what if that happens um so i think it's really positive that we are going to have a more reliable bus service it, that dialogue between first bus and us is is still really for me for a residence i think it can still be tra challenging because while first bus put out that that stuff on the um on their website you know you have to scan it and find the right bit that applies to you so it, you know, there's still improvements to be made in those things but i think that meant i do want a reliable bus service that we can uh, tell our neighbors about i think you could, I'm probably you're probably a bit stuck for time there so if you look like you want to move yeah. on to the next yeah, question just, yeah, yeah okay. right, I right. Want, yeah we are yeah. time's moving on but there was a specific question actually let's talk about bus priority which you because Kathy's got a question. Why are you removing all the two plus lanes at Portishead and Long Ashton and planning to put in the bus lane when the buses have been cut? And not well, they're coming back, hopefully, some of them. And all you are doing is increasing the pollution and cars idling whilst a bus lane remains completely empty. This is completely crazy. I, I mean, I, I cannot. You I can understand the first part of that question. I'm quite happy to answer that. I mean, I can understand where where Kathy's coming from because you know, you 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 could you could have that view, couldn't you? You could look at why on earth are they you know, you've got you've got a two plus lane there on Long Ashton bypass. Let's take that as the example. Why on earth would you close one of those to cars uh, for a bus network that is pretty non-existent at the moment? And as I say, Cathy, I mean, if you've been looking at some of the answers we've been giving, given, there have been some significant announcements from First and also our new DRT uh, um, bus services, which are coming in, which is going to be transformational for North Somerset. Now, bus prioritisation. It serves two purposes. I'm supportive of bus prioritisation because it's a reciprocal arrangement with our commercial bus operator, First Bus, that they would not put in additional capacity. They would not be able to lay on additional buses if all that's going to happen is they're going to get stuck in a long line of traffic. So it's it's common sense that we would we would want to make their journey time shorter. And also it's a condition of the funding. We were instructed by the Department for Transport that we had to put in uh, bus prioritization schemes to make sure that the throughput for the bus network was unfettered uh, by cars. So that's the reason why we're doing it. And I support it. And the other day I drove to Bristol myself, actually, along the um, the Long Ashton bypass, and there were about 40 or 50 cars um, in the, the one, you know, the, the less than two lane. And there was nothing in the in the uh, in the two plus two plus lane at all. There wasn't a single vehicle in it. And that's often the case that lane is underutilized and so we want to get the very best from the road network but i completely understand where the question is coming from and it's a it's a challenge that's been 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 put to me a few times but i think once you understand the uh, the frequency increases and the services that are coming back from first bus plus the drt network hopefully it makes more sense 
Thanks, Steve. Ash, I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything. I, mean, I, I just say, to Kathy, I mean, that X1 is used a lot. I've I got it in sometimes. It's absolutely packed. I mean, it was coming in when I got it last. I think at some point it wasn't even picking up because there were so many people trying to get to Bristol. I drive into Bristol as well sometimes, and I love my car. But I am completely on the page that a bus full of 75 people should get priority over me and two others that take up the same space. And actually, when you look at the plans for Long Ashton and what they're doing there, they're, they're quite sensible. And, you know, the parish council's talking about it. Little changes might be made. It's completely fine. I think people are trying to politicise it when it's not necessary. I mean, I, you know, mm. I know you have your views on Clevedon, but this Long Ashton move seems very sensible to me. Um, and I'm quite supportive of it. Uh, the other thing just to mention, I know we, we're running out of time here, uh, Cathy, it's not about penalising motorists either. So it's not this kind of polarised, you know, you're either a bus user or you're a, you're a car driver. You, you, you're not both. It clearly isn't true. Uh, most of the, bu the bus prioritisation stuff is about changing signals, prioritising signals. So that if you're sitting on a bus and you're approaching a signal, it will change from red to green. That's predominantly the sort of thing that we're doing. And, you know, we've got a few of these more structural works like on Long Ashton Bypass and um, the Smallway Junction. And the Smallway Junction in Kongsbury, the traffic light changes we're making there and the changes to the layout is going to help everybody, including motorists. So if you're in your car, you're going to be able to get to your destination much more quickly because we're doing that work. And I keep saying, I know Bridget doesn't like me saying this, but, you know, the best place to be is going to be on a bus. And the second place, best place to be is going to be in your car behind a bus. But it's about providing alternatives for people so that it's not just a kind of one size fits all um, dominated by cars, that we do have realistic options uh, to give people a range of choices for travelling around the county. And that's the right okay. thing to do. Thanks. Thanks both. Cathy, has another question here. How much did the bridge for the supposed peer? Supposed peer-to-peer -peer weight costs. Well, it's not supposed, Cathy. It's, it is a peer-to-peer -peer way. Uh, and I know the answer to that one. I think it was £1.2 million, but the funding from that for that bridge came from... Uh, we didn't didn't come from the council. It came from Highways England. I think some of it was uh, even money from the EU. Um, that came from various... Uh, Sustrans, I think, contributed. There were various funding pots associated with the delivery of that scheme, but it wasn't... Uh, uh, didn't come from council tax. Uh, Right, I'm just moving moving on. Let's see, I just have to pick and choose a question here. I think, uh, there were, I, yes, uh, question here from Brian. As a grandparent of a SEND child, I'm concerned we don't see much evidence of progress around improvement. There were meeting notes and newsletters, but they appear to have stopped being added to the website, so presumably the North Sunset Council website. Catherine. Yes. Um... There st still are newsletters. We produce a newsletter every month, um, SEND newsletter. I chair the SEND Improvement Board. So I would say that there is an enormous amount of work that's been going on. We work incredibly closely with the Parent Carers Forum, uh, who obviously, as you understand, are parents of children with special educational needs and disabilities to co-produce what we're doing for them. There's always going to be more work to do. And I will certainly look at the website myself and see if it's just that they're rather difficult to find. Occasionally, I know that our website isn't the most easily negotiable for people, but definitely the work's ongoing. There are many meetings, many minutes, and a regular newsletter that goes out to stakeholders. So um, possibly if you or your family are engaged with the Parent Care Forum, then perhaps that's the easiest way for you to get the regular newsletters. Otherwise, email me directly and I will make sure you get them. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, right, uh, it's it's almost seven o'clock. There, there are lots of questions here, quite a few of them are to do with, well, they're not really questions, they're, they're statements uh, around the Cleveland Seafront. We, we, we talked about the, uh, the Cleveland Seafront on, on, the, uh, on the stream tonight. Uh, Steve, can I just make, I've just noticed one from a yeah. Richard saying oh, about bus lanes that we don't allow motorcycles in it, but Bristol do. I, I don't know if anyone has the answer to that, but that's quite interesting. Um, Richard, sorry, yeah, yeah. But I thought that was quite an interesting comment. And I, I wonder whether, because it, it would seem we should be, you know, consistent with Bristol. I don't see a problem with, mm. but I don't uh, know. If uh, it's, it's something I picked up being a motorcyclist yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and they do allow them in Bristol because obviously motorcycles yeah. don't hold up the traffic. And yeah, do exactly. 
way and are a benefit to the environment too because they don't take up anywhere near as much space um so that's something that i have all, already picked up with officers and i'm sure they'll bring that to steve hogg because I, I think he's right uh, and yeah. if you have one policy all the way down to the cumberland basin and then it changes yeah that, that's going to cause a real issue yeah, uh, and yeah very happy with seeing tickets being handed out to motorcyclists who are coming the other way and they've been riding on bus lanes and all of a sudden they can't so yeah. that's something yeah. i'm sure people pick up oh Thanks. it makes sense doesn't it on, on the yeah, face value there it makes sense you know let's let's have a chat afterwards mark and thanks to richard for raising it yeah thanks for yeah. raising it thanks everyone um sorry we if we've not been able to or not had time to uh, uh respond to your particular question just before we uh, wrap up, and it's 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 just gone seven now. I'm not sure if uh, any of my colleagues want to, to to round off with any with any comments. Um, this has been an interesting experiment. These Facebook lives, um, not been done before, but um, they've been interesting to do. Um, not always fun, but you know we we welcome the challenge. That's what we're here for. You know we need to be accountable. Uh, Catherine, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, I was expecting questions on this, but they didn't come. And I just will remind people that it's tomorrow it'll be a year since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has actually impacted all of us so much. It's certainly exacerbated the cost of living crisis we're fighting. And, and you know, we reminds us we're living in a very unstable world. But I suppose I just want to thank all those people out there in the community who did step up and help when we saw what was happening with the displaced people fleeing that conflict. And we have over 700 people from the Ukraine living in North Somerset in approximately 250 um, homes. We're hoping to work really hard to help those people who are here move on and get some independence, help them to move into their own flats or houses get them into work while they're here so that they can live the best possible life. But obviously, like them, we pray that that conflict ends and at some stage they can go home. But we couldn't do what we've done for those people without you out there in the community, all the voluntary agencies and the individuals who have helped. It has been fantastic. And I hope that you'll all join us in a minute's silence tomorrow at 11, just to remember the losses these people have suffered and the ongoing conflict and hope that this time next year we won't be facing that again thank you Catherine. thank you here here yeah national minute silence tomorrow 11 11 o'clock okay well we didn't have uh, time at the end to talk um much more about the uh, forthcoming elections and the requirements around voter id but i think everyone should look out for all the we'll be pushing out lots of messages already have been pushing out lots of uh, messages around what is required uh, of you in terms of voter ID and, and what options you have such so, you know just keep uh, keep tabs on uh, what North Somerset Council put out on on Facebook uh, LinkedIn and on uh, on the other socials so um, I think thanks to my colleagues uh, this evening uh, for answering those those, those questions uh, thank you to all, everyone listening and uh, for posting those questions to us and um, I hope everyone has enjoyed the rest of their evening. Thank you. Thank you.